or good evening wherever you are in the world. Welcome to our online conference today. Before giving the floor to our dearest guest, I would like to introduce to our team. I'll be the moderator of today's conference. My name is Nana Chanchale Shuli. I'm a neurosurgeon and neuroscientist from Georgia country. Um, and this online educational meetings have started with Professor Hassan Kamil Sujan, the program manager of Izmir Atatürk Training and Research Hospital in Turkey, and goes on with contribution with all the residents, neurosurgeons and neurosurgeon residents from uh, the same department, neurosurgeons and neurosurgeon residents from nearby countries like Bulgaria and Georgia. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid the noise and voice pollution. You can ask your questions not by turning on the microphones, but by writing in the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentations, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate for the format of our meetings. So now I would like to inter briefly introduce uh, Professor uh, Jonich. He, uh, he's from Belgium and uh, he's a physiotherapist um, at the University of Bridge, Bridge University at Brussels. And uh, he's a physiotherapist and manual therapist uh, at the University Hospital in Brussels. He's a scientific chair of the Executive Committee of the Pain, Mind and Movement Special Interest Group of the International Associate of Study of Pain and holder of the chair of uh, Exercise uh, Immunology and Chronic fatigue in health and disease founded by European College of uh, the Congestive Lymphatic Therapy. Professor Nitsch plays a leading role in pain and motion research group, international um, collaborative the studies the in, uh, interplay between chronic pain and movement. Uh, and uh, so he's mostly known for um, exposing the theory of central uh, sensitization. Uh, uh, he suspects uh, that MECSF uh, CFS to be a, a dysfunction of the central nervous system, characterized by a, a heightened sensitivity of uh, pain uh, to other stimuli, such as light, sound, and chemical substances. He had uh, supervised uh, up to 30 PhD projects. And uh, Professor uh, Jonix, you're welcome to start screen sharing your lecture. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction and thank you for the kind invitation for me to speak to, um, to such an international audience uh, that uh, to privilege uh, for me. Um, if you have any questions, uh, of course, feel free to ask me. Uh, perhaps it's best, uh, if I understood for according to the format, that it's best to post them in the chat so we can uh, we can uh, respond to any questions you may have after the lecture. The topic for today is, like introduced, uh, central nervous system sensitization and also the new name, nociplastic pain in patients with chronic pain. What is the current state of the art and what are the implications for surgery in general and neurosurgery in particular? And I do this on behalf of my employees, the University of Brussels, but also the University Hospital of Brussels and the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Before we get started, I want to challenge your way of thinking by looking at genetic changes that are currently established in patients with chronic pain. There has been substantial amount of research looking at genetic changes in patients with chronic pain. And to summarize those findings, most often what they found is changes in, gene, in genes that relate to, as you can see on the slide, nerve system, immune system, energy metabolism, opioid receptor modulation, and the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis functioning. What's so remarkable about this is that none of the genes that have been identified to be uh, changed in people with chronic pain relates to the musculoskeletal system. So while we used to search in the musculoskeletal system for finding abnormalities, especially in patients with spinal pain, uh, they, we now understand that it's not primarily a problem of the musculoskeletal system, but rather a, a problem of the nerve system, the immune system, and stress response systems, such as the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis function. And this is very much in line with what I will be telling you today. And this is the overview of the lecture. So we have three main topics that we will address. First, I will address the issue of nociplastic pain and central sensitization because those 
terms are now commonly used and the term nociplastic pain is fairly new. So when we will explain it and how it relates and differs from central sensitization, and then we will dig in certain aspects that have been somehow misconcepted in relation to central sensitization. So that's the part where we will address the nonsense about central sensitization. And of course, we will uh, the, we will devote the majority of the presentation to stents of central sensitization, central sensitization. So the positive aspects and the important implications in a positive way for clinical practice about central sensitization. But first, of course, defining the two terms, central sensitization and nociplastic pain. This is the definition of the International Association for the Study of Pain, who launched this third name of pain group uh, or of pain subgroup within the pain population. And this is the third group of patients in addition to nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. We now have a third group of patients and they are labeled as nociplastic pain. And as you can see from the definition, the definition somehow covers also the definition of central sensitization. The first part of the definition of nociplastic pain is in fact the definition of what we understand currently as the mechanism of central sensitization. So to be very explicit about this, nociplastic pain is a group of patients that has clinical features that represents the underlying mechanism of central sensitization as the main driver of the pain complaint. Not to say that nociplastic pain patients have nothing else besides central sensitization, but those who end up in the subgroup of the chronic pain population that you can label as nociplastic pain have features that suggest that the main underlying mechanism is the central sensitization. And what is central sensitization? Well, as you are probably aware of, when you develop a bit of increased muscle tension, for instance, as is the, as is the case with this young girl who was sitting in an uncomfortable position, for quite a long time, she develops some increased muscle tension. This increased muscle tone is then, uh, uh, is then picked up by the sensory system, which is then sending input action potential towards the central nervous system, towards the spinal cord. From the spinal cord, it is then sent towards the brain where it is processed. In a normal situation, without increased sensitivity of the central nervous system, this at best will, will result in some minor discomfort. And then the person will change its, its posture, will do some more body movement, and the discomfort will quickly go away. However, what we see when the input, especially when it's nociceptive input, when it stays for a week or so, you see synaptic changes. Of course, you are well aware of the synaptic cleft and the synaptic transmission, which is summarized in the left part of this figure. And of course, the purple neuron in the figure is communicating with the green neuron. The purple neuron is the presynaptic neuron, which is communicating with the green neuron. And of course, when this synapse is used for one week in a row, as constant, constantaneous use of that synapse, then the synapse changes. It becomes much more efficient, as you can see, because the capacity of the purple neuron to produce uh, neurotransmitters is doubled in the right part of the figure. And of course, the capacity of the green neuron, the postsynaptic neuron, to capture these uh, and to, to collect these uh, neurotransmitters is doubled. Too. And this makes the same synapse after one week much more efficient. And the resulting effect of that is illustrated in the next animation. On the left part of the figure, you see what I've already explained, the normal situation. And in the right part, you see central sensitization illustrated. 
as you can see the orange arrow, so the inputs, the inputs from the spinal uh, area, from the muscles, from the joints, whatever kind of tissue in and around the lower back region or even the thoracic spine region or the same situation for the upper neck region. The sensory input is identical in the left and the right part of the figure, but the processing at the level of the spinal cord, but also at the level of the brain is totally different. It's much stronger, it's much more efficient, it's much more sensitive to whatever kind of sensory input. The net result is on the left side, you hardly experience some minor discomfort in the right situation with exactly the same sensory input. You feel a lot of pain, long lasting disabling pain. And that's what central sensitization is about, about synaptic changes at the level of the spinal cord, but also at the level of the brain. And you can resemble this with a spam filter that is no longer functioning well. The spam filter at the level of the spinal cord, which is, which is orchestrated by the brain. That's a nice metaphor to explain to your patients and that's how we often explain it to our patients in the clinic. But let's focus a bit more on the level of the brain. What you see over here is very familiar to you as well because these are the most commonly activated regions in the brain when somebody is experiencing pain. That can be even acute pain. It doesn't have to be chronic pain. And you see that there is increased activation in the amygdala, which are, of course, the fear center, anxiety center, and also stress center of our brain, the thalamus, the aqueductal gray, insula, the anterior cingulate, prefrontal cortex, but also the somatosensory cortex that shows increased activity. Then how does the brain of people with chronic pain differs from people with acute pain? Not in those regions that are commonly activated or increasingly activated, I should say, but in the way those areas are connected to one another. Highways connecting these brain regions is much more efficient. It's much better trained, if you want, due to the mechanism of long-term potentiation. The mechanism of long-term potentiation is what I just have explained. So the increased synaptic efficiency, that's also happening at the level of the brain in those highways connecting, for instance, the prefrontal cortex with the amygdala, but also, of course, in between neurons in certain areas of the brain, which are presumed to be part of what we now call the dynamic pain connectome, which used to be called the pain matrix. Melzack and Wall, they labeled it as the pain matrix. But then, of course, in the 50s of the previous centuries, we weren't so much aware of all the... Uh, the, the neuroscientific findings that had to be delivered at that point in time. And now we understand that it's not a matrix because a matrix is fixed and it's un unflexible. We now understand that this combined brain regions activity is very dynamic and it's very context specific and person specific. But still what is also very well studied is that there is increased efficiency in those brain regions. And that, of course, those brain regions are very well trained in patients with chronic pain to communicate all together. And this is also partly due to psycho psychological, behavioral, and cognitive factors, such as some of the factors which are listed on the slide, such as beliefs, what do patients believe that they actually have, and do they consider it a really threatening situation, if they do, then that for sure will strengthen the way that the brain is processing the sensory input as a real threatening uh, situation, and this increases the pain severity. The same is true for the anticipated consequences, which is very important for surgery, of course, because as soon as the patient hopes that and, and really believes in a strong way that the, the surgery will, will benefit the patient itself, then for sure the, uh, the, the odds of having a, an analgetic effect thanks to the surgical intervention is uh, substantially increased. So this is a brief introduction on 
the, the new terminology, nociplastic pain, and the underlying mechanism of central sensitization. Of course, we can talk for hours about the mechanism of central sensitization, but this is to keep the focus really clinically and to not dig too much into all the neuroscience and biological mechanisms that are known to be responsible for the increased sensitivity of the central nervous system, uh, which is commonly uh, named or termed uh, central sensitization. However, this entire pain science hype, if you want, and, and the mechanism of central sensitization has also led to some uh, inappropriate and not uh, scientifically valid translations such as, well, if they understand the mechanism of central sensitization as the main driver or underlying mechanism of chronic pain, then we should take the initial trigger, which is often a source of nociception away, and that should somehow be able to treat central sensitization. And also the way that pharmaceutical companies have tried to target the mechanism of central sensitization led to some serious problems. And there I will dig into now. Eliminating nociceptive input is, should not be the way to target our patients with central sensitization. On the contrary, to give you the best studied example in the field of surgery is what you see here, total knee replacement surgery, total knee Arthroplasty. We know that in general, this is in fact ineffective treatment, probably one of the most or best studied and most effective orthopedic surgical interventions. However, for approximately 30% of the patients, this is not the solution because we see, and this has been shown, and this is the first study that has showed this, but there are more studies afterwards, but this is the first one from Søren Sko in Aalborg University, which was published 10 years ago, showing that uh, in 30% of the patients, there is not a good outcome of the total knee replacement surgery, and those are the ones who show typical features of sample sensitization. Then, of course, many of those patients get, get revisit, revisit surgery, and this doesn't solve anything either because the sensitization just continues and continues, even though the presumed source of nociceptive input has clearly been replaced in those patients. And this shows that as soon as the sample sensitization is established, the initial cause or the presumed cause of nociceptive input, the damaged joint, if you want, in this circumstance, in this situation, removing it can no longer fix it. Because, of course, the central nervous system has changed, has switched into an increased state of sensitivity, and with taking away the initial trigger will not do the trick. We see similar findings now in a series of studies which are summarized in this slide. This has been uh, the same uh, predictive ability of central sensitization to poor surgical outcome has been shown also in um, shoulder uh, surgery, in spinal fusion uh, patients, so the low back pain patients receiving spinal fusion, but also in breast cancer surgery, but also to more nociceptive uh, targeted procedural treatments, for instance, for chronic uh, tennis elbow pain, and also for conservative interventions for knee osteoarthritis that specifically targets the nociceptive type of pain in, of course, patients who have a primarily non-nociceptive pain condition, such as nociplastic pain with underlying mechanism of central sensitization. So you can easy, if you can identify before surgery, the subgroup of patients that you see who have typical features of a dominant central sensitization type of pain and therefore fall into the category of nociplastic pain, those are the patients that will highly unlikely benefit from surgical intervention. Another problem of how central sensitization has been translated into clinical practice is centrally acting drugs. 
And here I would like to get your input in the chat. And I want to ask you what have these three fam famous people in common besides that they are all unfortunately no longer among us because all three of them sadly died a couple of years ago. What do they have in common? Please post your answer in the chat if you have a clue on what these three artists have in common. Aesthetic surgery, that's possible. I don't know for sure. Michael Jackson has had aesthetic surgery. I'm not sure about Prince, and I'm, I'm not aware of any aesthetic surgery that Dolores O'Reilly done, so the, the singer of the Cranberries received. Adding to drugs is probably uh, uh, an important one because all of them are thought Low to be. Pain? Yes. Sorry. Low back pain, perhaps? No. Low Michael Jackson? That's possible. Uh, I'm not sure. I know, for instance, that uh, uh, Prince, he suffered from lots of hip pain. He had severe hip osteoarthritis, if I'm, if I'm not uh, incorrect, but for sure, all of them were uh, taking lots of painkillers and they were all on mm -hmm. opioid painkillers. So they all died of opioid overdose. And of course, that's what they have in common. So they increased the use of painkillers because of course, as soon as you take opioid drugs, then of course you, you put in um, uh, endogenous, so uh, uh, endogenous pain relieving substances in your body. And then the body responds in a way that, oh, if this is externally administered into my body, then I should, no longer produce those naturally opioid opioids myself. So therefore, then patients, uh, as uh, if they are taking these opioid drugs longer and longer, then of course their body adapts, produces opioids itself less, and then of course you need higher doses, and then you gradually increase the dose. And what also happens is that there is an opioid-induced hyperalgesia, so there is an increase in central nervous system sensitization. Um, which is somehow similar to further uh, activating the mechanism of central sensitization, which is opposite to what the, the drug in itself theoretically is supposed to do. So because theoretically it's supposed to decrease sensitivity of a central nervous system. And this further fuels the patient's drive of using more opioids. And this change occurs pretty soon. We now understand from epigenetic studies that only four days after surgery, that if you use, if patients use more than four days of opioid drugs after surgery, then you already see epigenetic changes in the opioid receptor genes that somehow uh, creates the opioid induced hyperalgesia. And therefore, the patients will demand more and more analgesics. So that's not a good idea uh, to use those types of drugs especially not in the long term, but also not for considering their effects on the immune system because we know that opioids substantially suppress natural killer cell cytotoxicity, which in, in, in par, in, implies that the natural killer cells will, will no longer function as they're supposed to do. Uh, so therefore, for instance, in the field of cancer, regional anesthetics are preferred over general anesthesia and also opioids, of course. So those are two important clinical implications of central sensitization that we should carefully consider to who we will provide surgical interventions and that we should not stick to prescribing opioids at least not longer than uh, two or three days. But of course, we also see very positive impl implementation aspects of the science behind central sensitization. And the first one is 
that the label of nociplastic pain and central sensitization in particular somehow gives them some recognition and somehow stops the medical shopping because then, of course, they get a label and they understand their condition much better. This slide summarizes at least some of the most common medical diagnoses that have been associated with central sensitization and nociplastic pain in particular. In the right column, you see the estimated percentage of people within those populations that actually comply with the criteria for nociplastic pain. And I will get back to those criteria in a minute. And as you can see, it's a, it's a great variety of patients that actually have nociplastic pain. What's, to me, what's the most uh, striking aspect of it is that it is spread among the different medical disciplines. It's not only limited to neurosurgery, it's also in the field of rheumatology, physical medicine, emergency medicine, oncology, pediatrics, etc., etc. So you see it all over the medical system. We also see it in gastrointestinal disorders. So you can, you can continue. This is not at all a comprehensive list of medical diagnoses, but at least it gives you a uh, an overview of what you can expect and where you can expect to find central sensitization. And therefore, we now consider that there is something like a central sensitization continuum, not only at population level, but also at individual patient level. So in our clinic, we typically see patients that are somehow situated on this central sensitization continuum here in the middle, or more to the right, more extreme part of the continuum. And therefore, we hope, of course, that thanks to our treatment, we are able to reposition those patients a bit more to the left and hopefully to the extreme left part of the central sensitization continuum. So that's the good news also that this continuum is not fixed for individual cases. Central sensitization can be changed in a negative way, so it can aggravate, but it can get better too. And that's, of course, what we are aiming for. What's also important to understand is, as you saw that, when, for instance, in the low back pain population, which is, I assume, a, a population that you see very often, well, therefore, there in that population, of course, central sensitization only represents a subgroup of the population, even a minority. That's approximately one in four patients with chronic low back pain that has a clear nociplastic type of pain. But that subgroup is the most disabled one. That's important also. Those are the patients that suffer the most from low back pain, have the poorest quality of life, and also consume the most in the healthcare system. So this is the most disabled subgroup of the population. And this has not only been shown in the low back pain population, we see the same in the neck pain population, we see the same in the knee osteoarthritis population, et cetera, et cetera. However, not all chronic pain is, is nociplastic pain. For instance, patellar Achilles tendinopathies, they are predominantly peripheral pain states. They are not neuropathic pain. They are most often not nociplastic pain. Mostly they are considered inflammatory or nociceptive types of pain. That doesn't mean that individual cases of patellar or Achilles tendinopathies can have a nociplastic type of pain. For sure that's possible, but it will be a small minority. Approximately one in 10 patients will show with a clinical picture that is presumed to be nociplastic type of pain. So how do we identify that Temporal sensitization or nociplastic subgroup in the population. How do, we, how do we identify them clinically? Nearly 10 years ago, we developed the first set of criteria to identify that subgroup. But I will not get into the details of that because now, more recently, two years ago, the International Association of the Study of Pain released the first general um, criteria, clinical criteria to identify nociplastic pain. And this is supported by the International Association for the Study of Pain. 
and uh, the, those criteria are now available to be used in clinical practice and also for research purposes. The nice thing, and if I can ask to, to cut down your microphone because we get some quite some crowd now. Oh, sorry, uh, there are some uh, noise, and yeah. I will. I will turn up all the microphones first. And I will let you turn on your microphone again. Sorry for that. Okay. Okay, but you can start again. Oh. Here it is. Do you see the slide yeah. where we were? Yeah. Yes, we do. Okay. So here you see the criteria, and I will walk you through the criteria. It might seem to be complex, but it's not that complex, and it's fairly straightforward. So if I walk you through these criteria, you will be able to use it tomorrow in clinical practice because it builds substantially on general clinical reasoning and different, dif differential diagnosis uh, that you are used to do in clinical practice. So I will walk you through these criteria with a small case study from Mrs. Nee. Mrs. Nee is 55 years of age. She's single. She suffers from knee osteoarthritis, uh, and she has been suffering from pain for more than 10 years. She requests pain relief and to return to her work. She wants to get back to swimming and cycling and walking in her leisure time. So obviously, based on what she told us, she suffers from pain for more than three months. That's the first mandatory criteria. Uh, to So the, the criteria for nociplastic pain purely focus on chronic pain and therefore it should be pain of at least three months duration. The next criteria focus on the anatomical spreading of the pain. And then it should be spreading pain that the patient presents to be considered a possible nociplastic type of pain, because we understand that spreading of pain is a classical feature of central sensitization. On the right part of the slide, you see her pain drawing, and you see that the pain is spreading well beyond the anatomical region of the presumed source of nociception, so well beyond the knee region. And in fact, she has pain all over her left lower limb. So for sure, she meets this second criteria of spreading of the pain. We know that spreading of pain is an important feature of central sensitization, not only in knee osteoarthritis, but also in low back pain patients, also in neck patients, et cetera, also in shoulder pain patients. This has been shown. Of course, this is more of a the type of clinical reasoning that, I, that you are used to do, and therefore a couple of exercises to practice this. And when you look at the pain drawing on this slide, I, my question for you is, does this pain drawing from a low back pain patient, so a different patient as the one that we are considering, reflect spreading of pain suggesting of nociplastic pain or not? What do you think if you see this type of pain drawing in a low back pain patient? Is this suggestive of nociplastic pain or not? Please respond in the chats. What do you think? The pink zones by itself does not represent the low back pain zones. Sorry? I mean, if you mean the pink zones in this picture, that do not correspond to low back pain zones or any hernias that... So what you, what you see in the, in the picture is the pain drawing that is completed by a patient with low back pain. And the question is whether this is the type of spreading of pain that is suggestive of nociplastic pain or not? 
You mean the arrays in pink, pink, right? Yeah, in pink. True. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's not, definitely not a low back pain. There is one comment in the chat part. Uh, Rehbi Gülman mm -hmm. says yes. no plastic pain. Yes, yes, it is suggestive of low of no plastic pain. I agree. So if a patient with low back pain presents this type of spreading of pain, this is suggestive of no plastic pain. And second one, this again, same question. This is a patient with low back pain, and this is the pain drawing completed by the patient, as you see in the right part of the slides. Again, same question. Is this suggestive of nociplastic pain or isn't it suggestive of nociplastic pain? Again, you can answer in the chat. Okay, now we have a an answer of not no plastic pain. What is the criteria precisely it's asked? Well, the criteria to differentiate is, of course, if you would have, for instance, in this example, if you would have nothing but pain in the area of the low back region over here, so for instance, over here, so in the in the area which is segmentally related at the very least to the presumed source of nociception, then we can still consider this as a normal pain presentation. And over here in this particular case, if there are some, uh, some possible sources of nociception at the level of the thoracic spine, for instance, if she suffers from osteoarthritis at the, at the thoracic spine, or, is there, or if there are if there is marked increased uh, muscle tone in the thoracic spine area, then for sure I agree that this can be normal type of pain report. However, if there is no reason why the patient would have pain at the thoracic spine level, then this becomes spreading of pain that can be suggestive of nociplastic pain. Of course, this is only one out of the many criteria but it's one of the mandatory criteria. So you should have spreading beyond the area of the presumed source of, of nociception. And that is at least beyond the segmentally related areas of the presumed source of nociception. Also in this case, considering, but of course that's the information that you don't have. So I tell you, if there is no reason why she's suffering from thoracic spine, uh, thoracic spinal pain, then this becomes also an indication of nociplastic pain. But of course, we need to develop our criteria further, and this is not enough, of course, to actually uh, decide whether it's nociplastic pain or not. But there has to be pain more than three months, and the pain should spread beyond the presumed area of nociceptive pain. And this brings us to differentiating nociplastic from nociceptive pain. And that's the third criterion. And of course, in many, possibly in all our patients, there is some source of nociception. But the question here is, is nociceptive pain mainly or even entirely responsible for the pain? Or is there something in addition that is probably even more important than the nociceptive driver? And in that respect, for assessing this third criterion, we need to consider, for instance, that many people who don't suffer from pain have presumed sources of nociception, such as bulging disc, osteoarthritis of the facet joints. As you can see on this slide, those spinal, that's, that, uh, those types of spinal damage there, that is very common in the asymptomatic population. And as you can see, those impairments, those dysfunctions actually increase substantially together with age. So therefore, they are considered to be normal changes in the spinal cord, in the spine, in the spine uh, and not should always be labeled as real sources of, uh, of nociception that we should fix. So that should be taken into account when deciding whether or not nociceptive mechanisms are the main drivers of the low back pain. 
And as you can see, this not only accounts for a bulging disc and osteoarthritis of the facet joints, but it accounts for so many radiological diagnoses. Not to say that radiological diagnoses are not important, on the contrary, of course, but we should closely balance this and integrate this type of scientific information into, uh, into our clinical reasoning, because this is not one study, this is a meta-analysis of all available studies up to 2014. In returning back to our case of Mrs. Knee with, with long-term uh, chronic knee osteoarthritis, this is what the imaging findings revealed. So she had possible synovial pathology, anterior superior hophitis, some diffuse femoropatellar cartilage wear, and limited knee osteoarthritis in her left knee. Importantly, the MRI findings were the MRI findings were similar as a couple of years before. So there was no progression, yet the clinical picture dramatically got worse in between those years. And that's also very important that you see a dramatic increase in clinical picture, much more pain, much more disability. However, the MRI findings are very similar, if not identical identical as a couple of years ago. Radiology doesn't show pain. I agree. It's a, a nice comment. Thank you for that. That very much supports what I was saying. But of course, it's still important and we need to take it into account when doing the clinical reasoning. But in general, of course, we need to get back to the physiology behind central sensitization. And that's what's illustrated in this figure. Of course, the nociceptive input, which is, of course, present in patients with knee osteoarthritis, where you also have lots of inflammation in the joint and the different tissues involved in the knee joint, which are fueling and activating the nociceptive, the peripheral nociceptors, which are then producing lots of nociceptive input to the central nervous system. From there, of course, the spinal cord becomes sensitized and also the brain becomes sensitized producing lots of output, including the previous criterion, the spreading of the pain, which is presumed to be responsible or presumed to be a typical feature of sample sensitization. So we concluded for Mrs. Nee that she did comply with the first and the second criteria. We concluded that nociceptive pain was present in her situation, but was not the main driver and surely not entirely responsible for her knee pain. Therefore, we concluded to the fourth criterion, which is another major differential diagnosis criterion, differential diagnosis with neuropathic pain. And again, many patients have some features of neuropathic pain, but we need to be sure whether neuropathic pain is the main driver of the pain disorder or not. And then, of course, we have to look at the criteria for neuropathic pain. And these are the internationally currently accepted criteria for neuropathic pain. To summarize them, there have to be two main criteria met. Firstly, there has to be, and this is in the lower part of the slide, there has to be a diagnostic test confirming a lesion or disease of the nervous system. For instance, Parkinson disease, stroke, or in the peripheral nerve system, damage to a peripheral nerve, a lesion of the median nerve, for instance. So that has to be present. It, it doesn't have to be presumed or believed that there is that there is uh, actually uh, uh, some damage in the nervous system, nor there has to be clear evidence of damage of the nerve system. And of course, that damage to the nervous system has to be linked to the clinical picture, because of course, the majority of people with damage, objective F, damage to the nervous system do not suffer from pain or sensory symptoms. We see much more sensory symptoms such as numbness, tinglings, pinpricks, which are much more common in patients with neuropathic pain as compared to patients with nociplastic or nociceptive pain. So that's very important for the diagnosis of neuropathic pain. 
Getting back and applying this to Mrs. Nee, she didn't have any objective evidence of damage to the peripheral or central nervous system, so we could exclude the possibility of neuropathic pain. So we continued the seven step diagnostic process, and then we explored whether she had in the fifth step evoked pain hypersensitivity phenomena. What's that, the evoked pain hypersensitivity phenomena? Well, those are clinical, very easily to be done in clinical practice at clinical tests, such as the ones listed on the slides. And one of the three, if one of the three listed on the slides is positive, that's enough. So the first one, gently stroking the skin with a brush or cotton pad, as you see in the left part of the slide, is enough. And that, of course, has to provoke pain hypersensitivity, because normally, if you do that, it should not provoke any pain. If it does, it, it, this is enough to actually met this criteria. If it's negative, you can continue with the other criteria, with the other ways of assessing evoked pain hypersensitivity, which is palpation, simple palpation with approximately four kilogram of force. Then you may wonder, how do I know whether it's four kilogram of force? Well, if you use your tongue to press in the painful area in the low back region, for instance, in your patients, and you gradually increase the, the force under your palpating thumb and the thumb, the thumb nail becomes wide, then you know that it's approximately four kilogram of force that you use for palpation. Again, this, this should normally not provoke any pain. If it does, then it's a sign of evoked pain, hypersensitivity, and this criterion is met. Like said, only one of them is enough to comply to this criterion. If none of the first two are positive, then you can continue with doing the same with a metal object. So just placing a metal object like a coin, 20 degrees with uh, against the skin of the, uh, on top of the skin of the painful area of the patient, or you heat it uh, up to 40 degrees, and then you again put it on the skin of the painful area and you see whether this provokes pain or not. Because normally 20 degrees or 40 degrees should feel a little bit cold, a little bit warm, but it shouldn't provoke any pain. And therefore, if it does, this is evidence of evoked pain hypersensitivity. So this is what we did with Mrs. Nee, and this was positive for her. So we continue in this clinical reasoning. Uh, decision making three and we are over here and this was positive also the fifth criteria so we continue over here and then we asked ourselves does Mrs. Nee present with a history of pain hypersensitivity well she did what is a history of pain hypersensitivity this is simple questioning regarding hypersensitivity to touch pressure movement and heat cold and this is what she said. I experienced difficulties undressing, lifting, walking, or standing for a long time. And during household activities, I am un unable to wear the type of shoes I prefer, especially the last one is clear hypersensitivity. So again, this criterion is met. Of course, her increased sensitivity to walking is also fairly typical for patients with knee osteoarthritis. Approximately one out of two patients suffers from more pain in response to self-paced uh, six minutes walking exercises. And this again is a typical feature of central sensitization because baseline levels of central sensitization typically predict whether a patient with knee osteoarthritis has actually had experiences increases pain following uh, walking exercises. Then she also presents with comorbid symptoms such as sleep problems. This is what she said, Mrs. Nee. Falling asleep is often a challenge and I wake up frequently throughout the night and total I sleep approximately four hours per night. This is also very common. Up to 80% of patients with chronic spinal pain have insomnia-like uh, comorbidities. And again, Mrs. Nee also presents with this comorbidity, but... It shouldn't per se have to be the sleep comorbidity. Other comorbidities include sensitivity to sound, light, or odors, fatigue, or cognitive problems such as short-term memory disturbances. All of them, one of them is enough 
to comply with the final criterion of having at least one of the comorbid symptoms. And this brings us to the final step, that is seventh step of comorbidity or comorbid, comorbid symptoms is the final step in the seventh step clinical decision-making tree to differentiate between nociceptive, neuropathic, and nociplastic pain. And the conclusion for Mrs. Nee is that she presents with probable nociplastic pain. We cannot conclude it with certainty because, of course, we're working with patients and this is not pure science, but we can conclude with a large prob probability that this is the type of patient presenting with a dominant central sensitization mechanism underlying driving her pain disorder and therefore she should not receive surgery in this particular case. And this is the clinical reasoning that uh, that is typically done in those patients. If central sensitization is driving the pain, then we should target central mechanisms with our treatments. So brain targeted treatments are indicated, while if central sensitization is not the dominant underlying mechanisms, then for sure we can target peripheral nociceptive driven mechanisms. Okay, let's move on. And uh, now that you know how to clinically recognize or differentially different or differentiate those patients with nociplastic pain, we can continue with other positive aspects of central sensitization and the science behind central sensitization. It's also a very nice model to educate to your patients. We use it quite a lot for explaining patients pain to our patients with chronic spinal pain. And by doing so, by explaining the mechanism of central sensitization as the underlying mechanism of their pain and suffering, this helps patients a lot. So that's also a positive aspect of the science behind central sensitization. Of course, we need to tailor our pain education based on the type of pain. And educating, educating our patients about their pain is always indicated, I would say. But of course, depending on the type of dominant pain they are presenting, the education may differ substantially. As you can see in this slide, where we summarize that in patients with a dominant neuropathic type of pain, of course, then you explain what neuropathic pain is and what the role is of the damage of the nervous system. And of course, you can also explain central sensitization because of course, there is lots of central sensitization in neuropathic type of pain. There is no dominant role for central sensitization in nociceptive type of pain. So don't explain this to your patients when they have a dominant nociceptive type of pain. Of course, obviously explain it when they have a dominant nociplastic type of pain. A final positive aspect of the science behind central sensitization is that it embraces the biopsychosocial approach to managing chronic pain and chronic spinal pain in particular. Because we know that once central sensitization is identified as one of the main underlying mechanisms of the pain that the patient is presenting, then we should look at the drivers, the perpetuating factors of central sensitization. And there you end up with many of the common lifestyle factors. We now understand that poor diet, poor sleep, stress and stress intolerance, physical inactivity are main drivers, perpetuating factors of central sensitization. And therefore we need to target those lifestyle factors primarily in the group of nociplastic type of pain patients. And this is a way of course, by addressing those lifestyle factors, by targeting those lifestyle factors, we can actually reactivate spam filter by making them more physically active, by improving their sleep, by providing them cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, we can increase, improve their sleep, which will then 
reactivates the spam filter. Improving their diet will also decrease sensitivity of the central nervous system and making them more tolerant to stress, daily stress, will also decrease the sensitivity of the central nervous system. But at the end of this talk, I would like to ask you, do you think that central sensitization should be the main target or reducing central sensitization should be the main treatment target? Personally, I don't think so. I think the main treatment target, and you are all clinicians, so I hope that you will agree with me that improving quality of life in our patients should be the main treatment target. But when you look at the main drivers of quality of life, for instance, in people with chronic spinal pain or chronic neck pain, you end up with the same factors that perpetuate central sensitization. Diet, poor sleep, stress intolerance, physical inactivity, patients' beliefs are key drivers of quality of life in patients with chronic spinal pain, chronic neck pain, chronic low back pain, etc. Finally, and then we are ready for answering any questions you may have. I want to resemble inflammation with central sensitization. Of course, inflammation is very much known by each one of you. And this is a highly different mechanism as compared to central sensitization, obviously. But they share many aspects too. Of course, inflammation is a homeostatic driver. It's adaptive in the short term, but it's maladaptive in the long term. Inflammation cannot be assessed by a single biomarker. C-reactive protein is a very broad, but not the gold standard, because if you want to thoroughly assess inflammation, you have to combine multiple, myo multiple biomarkers together, including pro-inflammatory cytokines, including uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no single gold standard because the mechanism is way too complex. And its inflammation is also a general term covering various clinical and biological presentations in a variety of patients. And it, the way it presents also varies substantially from patient to patient. But of course, inflammation is a key mechanism in a wide variety of clinical uh, conditions and diseases. And all those things that I have now explained from inflammation also applies to central sensitization. And again, I want to stress that inflammation and central sensitization are very different mechanisms, probably even related, but that's not the message. The message here is that they share many common aspects and that we need to take into account when looking at the scientific literature and also when approaching our patients. Central sensitization is not a clear-cut mechanism it's a mechanism that can be presented in individual patients very differently. And you cannot have one clinical test or one scientific test that says, okay, this is central sensitization or not. You need to do clinical reasoning. And that's why I hope to have explained to you that you can use the, the, the clinical criteria for nociplastic pain to recognize the subgroup of the pain population that presents with predominant central sensitization type of pain or uh, nociplastic type of pain. To summarize, I hope you can take this information to the clinic and understand that central sensitization allows us and our patients to understand chronic pain much better, especially chronic spinal pain. You can easily recognize it clinically in your patients without demanding for additional tests, unless, of course, you want to rule out certain aspects of nociceptive or predominant neuropathic pain. You can use the central sensitization model to explain chronic pain to your patients. And precision medicine for chronic pain is more than accounting for central sensitization. It also implies addressing relevant lifestyle factors in individual patients. And we know that those lifestyle factors perpetuate the mechanism of central sensitization. Of course, I am available for you to answer any questions, but you can also check out our information that we make available for you on our website, including tools for clinical practice, the Pain in Motion website and its social media are available for anyone. 
Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your wonderful lecture. Um, I do have a few questions. Uh, first of all, what exactly are the diseases where we should suspect uh, the central acidization components? For example, what about the central pain or postural pain or low back pain perhaps where we do see the hernia that corresponds, the pain dermatomes on corresponds the hernia, but if, uh, they, I mean, post-surgically they still have pain, whatever we call um, failed back surgery. And then perhaps we might try spinal cord stimulation and at what point we should suspect that it might be central sensitization. Um, yes, uh, of course, many of the failed back surgery patients actually do have typical um, and many features of central sensitization. So uh, I don't think there is enough evidence yet to really conclude that uh, failed back surgery is all is nothing but central, central sensitization. I think we're not there yet in terms of scientific evidence, but for sure. Uh, there are many features uh, of central sensitization typically shown in patients with failed, with failed back surgery. So at least you should consider the possibility of nociplastic pain in patients with failed back surgery. That's, that's one thing. Another thing in terms of uh, combining the postural adjustment and the way that patients respond to that in terms of pain relief or no pain relief, that's important also. And that can be very important for the criterion where you uh, decide whether or not nociceptive mechanisms are mainly driving the pain complaints. So one of the criteria that I've explained was differentiating between dominant nociceptive pain or not. And there you use, of course, those clinical uh, tests like changing the posture and whether it complies with uh, a bulging type of pain or whatever central centralized pain or not. Those kind of aspects are very important and you still use them to, of course, differentiate between the typical nociceptive driven pain or non-nociceptive driven pain. And if there is a non-nociceptive driven pain, then of course you have two more options, neuropathic pain or nociplastic pain. Does that somehow answer your questions? Yes, it does. And for, for as the next step, for example, if you move to spinal cord stimulation and the patient uh, does not respond to spinal cord stimulation, can we assume that there is as um, this central sensitization, I mean, uh, the first step is surgical management, but if, even if the standard surgical management and uh, the removal of this hernia does not work, then we move to spinal cord stimulation. And then even if the spinal cord stimulation does not work, can we suspect this or still we should follow any guidelines to diagnose this? Yes. It's a very relevant question, uh, and I'm afraid there is not enough evidence to have a clear-cut evidence-based answer. However, I have some information for you to consider in that respect. It is possible. For sure, you should take it into account that it is uh, with that, 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 that type of patient that is also not responding to the spinal uh, cord stimulation, that uh, is actually having lots of central sensitization and therefore also responds in a hypersensitive way to also the even minor surgery, of course, by uh, providing the spinal, uh, spinal cord stimulation. So that they respond in a hypersensitive way to the spinal cord stimulation. That's, that's possible. Theoretically, of course, spinal cord stimulation is a nice and uh, valid way of approaching the mechanism of central sensitization. But the problem, of course, is that you also need at least some surgical interventions to actually provide it. And that will, of course, uh, will always be a trigger for the central nervous system to increase its sensitivity. Because that's why I also emphasized the resemblance between inflammation and central sensitization. So any surgical intervention will always somehow, at least in the short term, activate the sensitivity of the central nervous system. So you get at least some central sensitization following each type of surgery, because that's kind of a protective way of the body to make sure that the patient will, will, will stay uh, at low ac activity levels in the days following surgery. Uh, so any surgical intervention will somehow be a minor trigger for increased sensitivity of the central nervous system. 
Luckily, of course, many patients following spinal cord uh, stimulation will then be able to decrease the sensitivity of the central nervous system, but at current, we don't have enough evidence to say that it's a, a valid treatment for central sensitization. So, yeah, there's still more work to do in that area, but hopefully with what I've explained to you, you can improve your clinical reasoning and, and at least consider that patients uh, cannot benefit from it because of the hypersensitive response to the, to the treatment. Thank if you. that helps. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I was also wondering, for example, post stroke pains or central pains or, for example, complex regional pain syndrome, are those diseases you know, like... like type of uh, central sensitization problems? Yes, but of course, in complex regional pain syndrome, you have two types. And then, of course, you have, uh, I always mixed up the, the type. Well, I think type one is the one where you have, have objective damage to the, the peripheral nervous system. And that subgroup, of course, is typical neuropathic pain, because there you have objective evidence of the median nerve. And then, of course, you, you have neuropathic pain. But the type two, uh, complex regional pain syndrome patients are uh, typical patients of uh, central sensitization, yes. Yeah, reflex hepatitic dystrophy. Yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah, that's what it used to call. Uh, it's used to call it that way. Yeah, but now they call it the complex regional pain syndrome, yeah. Uh, and I was also wondering well, if you see the role of deep brain stimulation there, like, uh, for example, the stimulation of uh, WPL or WPM of thalamus or perhaps peri aqueductal gray or periventricular gray measure or yeah. rostral anterior uh, cingulate gyrus. I was wondering what are your thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, theoretically perfect. This fits totally into the story that, I, that I've that i presented to you today and this Theoretically, it fits very well into our understanding of the, the key role, the central role of the brain and those brain areas in particular. For instance, the thalamus, stimulating the thalamus, surely activates endogenous analgesic systems, et cetera. So theoretically, that's the way to proceed. Unfortunately, nowadays, when you look at the, the systematic reviews and meta-analysis, at medium and long term, those treatments don't do that well, as you are probably aware of. But most often, there is a, a fairly strong, uh, at least medium effect sizes, analgesic effects in the short term. But at the long term, unfortunately, the, the treatments not often produce that well in, uh, in, in, in the long term. Uh, but of course, it's a developing treatment for sure. And I, I greatly look forward to the science in the upcoming years and hopefully with improving technology, improving treatment modalities, we can actually uh, uh, make it work better as it's currently doing. One uh, critical remark to that respect, of course, is that um, it's possible, of course, that, that we have to um, somehow, uh, because the idea, of course, is to target the dynamic pain connectome, the, the combined activity of brain regions in the brain and to somehow disconnect this circuitry in the brain. And that's, of course, valid reasoning, a valid way of clinical reasoning. But given the complexity and the variability and the dynamic aspect of the dynamic pain connectome, it's possible that we need to probably somehow adapt this more individually. That would be my guess, and that we need to take further actions in the, the route towards precision medicine and that we that we somehow make this more individually tailored and that's probably one of the problems with the trials where they do exactly the same type of uh, brain simulation in in a group of patients and uh, yeah that that would be my uh, suggestion for improving that important field of research and clinical research thank you and is there any age or sex differences for the pain perception or... Yes, there is, but the difference is not as large as we used to think. So based on systematic reviews, we conclude that there is a small difference in terms of uh, pain perception, uh, and but it's, it's a very small difference. So, so uh, it's, it's not even worthwhile mentioning the difference. What's more important is that there is more and more research showing that the underlying pain mechanisms can be different in both genders. So therefore, nowadays, most mechanistic pain mechanistic studies take into account gender differences 
uh, and uh, look at possible differences. For instance, in terms of glia activations, there are, I haven't talked about this, but we know that increased activation of glia cells in the central nervous system is one of the underlying drivers of central sensitization. And we know that this can be different between the two genders. So yeah, this, this gender issue is becoming more and more important in the field of pain. And of course, the, major, the majority of the pain patients are women, and this can possibly be explained by differences in certain pain mechanisms. But there is more work to be done to, to further get into uh, get onto the, the bottom of the, all that. Okay, so, and um, I was also wondering, uh, do you perform any neuroimaging studies and do you see any changes in uh, neuroimaging studies, maybe tractographies or in limbic system, or uh, are there any changes in the patients affected? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, when you compare chronic pain patients, we see that uh, many of the brain areas that are showed in the beginning of the, uh, of the presentation, that they are increasingly activated. For instance, we see uh, much more activity in the thalamus and more activity in the in the, the amygdala and the prefrontal areas. But of course, even more importantly, is that the connection between those brain regions becomes much more uh, much stronger. So the connectivity, the brain connectivity, is much stronger between certain areas. To give you one example, for instance, normally the prefrontal cortex should inhibit the amygdala activity. But what we see in many chronic pain patients is the reverse, that the prefrontal cortex further excites the amygdala. And the amygdala is presumed to be one of the drivers in the brain of this entire sensitization mechanism. So yes, we see marked changes in the brain uh, thanks to imaging studies. The problem, of course, is that many of the imaging studies lack standardization in terms of the way the images are taken and the way that the, 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 the data are processed. So there, that aspect of neuroscience has some room for improvements, but it, but all, it has already learned us a lot, of course. Thank you for that. Uh, so the details responses there are um, a few questions in the chat section Nana, uh, so, Nana. Uh, there's a yeah can you hear me uh, hi uh, let Vepi ask his question himself He's okay part. okay okay Vepi, you can turn on your microphone okay uh, it's a very good uh, useful uh, lecture thank you for this but uh, i'm wondering what is the risk factor for central sensitization and which person is more prone to nosoplastic pain very good question yeah very good question but unfortunately we don't have clear answers to that what we see is, is a bit similar uh, as in, uh, for, for chronic pain in general, but in particular, those who are prone to central sensitization are the ones who have <coughs> had, for instance, um, uh, a past trauma. We know, for instance, in the low back pain, and that those, those are nice German studies available, that uh, and, and those German people, they studied many patients with chronic low back pain, and they showed that there is a marked difference in terms of features of central sensitization when you compare the subgroup of the chronic low back pain population who had past traumatic events, and that can be even childhood traumatic events or more recent traumatic events, versus those who don't have any history of traumatic events. So we know for sure that that's one of the mechanisms that is linked to having increased odds of developing central sensitization and nociplastic pain. The second one is uh, sleep problems. We know that there is more and more evidence showing that uh, people who start to develop sleep problems and insomnia in particular, that they have more odds of developing central sensitization. 
Also, there is, in terms of sleep problems, there is also the, the subgroup of patients who first develop pain and then start to develop sleep problems. And then the, the sleep problems also becomes a driver of mechanisms such as central sensitization. <laughs> so again, this can work uh, two ways. Those are two aspects that we are now pretty sure of based on scientific evidence that is somehow increasing the odds of developing central sensitization. For sure, there are more factors that contribute to the increased odds of developing it, but that's hopefully what future science and scientific studies will reveal. Thank you. You're welcome. We don't have any questions in the chat. Uh, Doctor, suggest is there anything you would like to ask? Yeah, I, I want to thank the professor again one more time. And I want to thank everyone who joined us today, this evening. Thank My you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. It's very interesting. Thank you. And this.